of business for kicking things off today will be a uh, presentation from Jojo to uh, set the stage and get the discourse running. So I think at this stage, Jojo, if you'd like to proceed with your deck. Thank you, Matthew. Let me share my screen. Thank you for having me today on this uh, momentous occasion. My name is Jojo Flores, and I am the uh, co-founder of Plug and Play Tech Center, which I started in Silicon Valley in 2006. I came back to Manila in 2013 to oversee our operations here in Asia, including China, Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, Thailand, the Philippines, and Indonesia. Opening with this quote from uh, the late Pierre Nanterm, former CEO of Accenture, digital is the main reason just over half of the companies in the Fortune 500 have disappeared since the year 2000. Over the last few decades, corporations that failed to innovate have been consistently disrupted by new entrants or existing players which have successfully embraced innovation as part of their strategic agenda. This serves as a reminder that companies often get too comfortable with their core businesses. Their focus on existing core businesses render them unable to anticipate the innovations and new technologies that can pose as potential disruptions targeting their own very core businesses. The question is no longer why should your business innovate, but rather in what ways are you innovating and how fast? The business landscape of today have changed undeniably and it is specially amplified by the pandemic. Traditional big companies are facing the challenge of keeping up with disruptors right and left. They are not addressing the rapid market shifts, gaps, or new customer demands before you, before you know it. A startup comes along, scales quickly, launches a new service or product, and is now their biggest competitor. And that's one of the biggest worries of large companies right now. The urgency for businesses to put forth effort to devise and execute on ideas is increasing. How businesses respond is critical to their continued success and ultimately their existence. The profound, the profound shifts in how people behave as we adopt in this new normal era has boosted digital technology and innovation to levels we've never seen before. As we have restricted mobility and decreased direct interactions, we have never been this dependent on technology. It's now that we see technology has moved from a growth enabler to a business continuity factor. And as businesses readjust for the future, it needs to do both and rethink how adopting the innovation will support business resilience post pandemic. It is here where digital innovation is highlighted, seeing its role in supporting business survival and continuation throughout the pandemic. At Plug and Play, we believe that innovation should be open to anyone, anywhere. A platform of open collaboration, whereby all of the best minds and ideas can truly discover and work with each other. <clears throat> Over the last five years, we've seen growing consciousness from corporations to innovate and embrace new technology. It's not anymore just an IT project for companies, but a necessary aspect of its company-wide strategy. Many years ago, R&D was done internally. However, we're seeing many corporations taking a more hybrid model where they complement their innovation strategies by working with startups. Why, you may ask. I think because startups have that distinct characteristic of being disruptive and agile. They're also a great resource of talent. In addition, I also think that large corporations are realizing that they should stick to what they do best and outsource talent and technology solutions when and where it makes sense. Another growing trend that we're seeing with many conglomerates is the creation of CVCs or corporate venture capital. These companies are investing into companies strategic to their various business units. 
some of them are looking into diversifying their businesses. And of course, return on investments. So plug and play becomes their resource, not only for deal flow, but also market trends and the like. <clears throat> Fast forward to today, we now focus on three main activities at plug and play. First, we're an early stage investor with over 1,500 startups in our portfolio. We invest worldwide with about 60% of our investees in the US and the remaining outside of the US. Here in Asia, we have invested in over 160 companies so far. We've been lucky enough to have, our, <clears throat> to have over 20 of our startups become unicorns, including eight which we announced this year alone. Second, we're a startup accelerator. We see about 20,000 startups a year worldwide, out of which we accelerate over 2,000 of them in 60 plus programs across 36 cities in 20 countries. Essentially, we give our startups heightened access to mentors, investors, and of course, large corporations. Which leads me to our third activity, which is corporate innovation. We are the largest corporate innovation platform in the world, working with over 520 conglomerates in 18 industry verticals. Broadly, we augment the innovation strategies of our corporate partners by providing them existing and working solutions offered by startups, thereby enhancing their internal innovation activities. Throughout the years, we have been able to leverage on our network to mitigate our investment risks. Examples of this are our bets on Dropbox and Lending Club. We showed the Dropbox to our friends at Sequoia Capital, and when they gave us the nod, we invested alongside them. The same thing with Lending Club. We introduced Renault to Jeff Crow at Northwest Ventures to get his buy-in before pulling our own trigger on the deal. We also leverage on our university relationships. Kevin Mahajer, the founder of SoundHound and a doctorate degree holder in sound technology came from Stanford. We also met Andri, Andrew Grauer, founder of Course Hero when he was still a sophomore from Cornell University. Until today, we discover great startups from universities all around the world. And finally, we have our international unicorns like N26 that we met through our international corporate program in Germany, as well Rappi from Brazil and Flutterwave from South Africa. This gives you a snapshot of the depth and breadth of the corporate network we're building at Plug and Play. We now work with close to 550 companies around the world and we'll continue to grow this part of our business in the short and long term. We feel that this platform, which expands to different industries, gives us a unique view of innovation and technologies that is happening in all business sectors. It is important for me to point out and describe our corporate innovation platform as an open one. What this essentially means is that we have several member companies composite composing one vertical platform. For instance, our startup Autobahn mobility program in Stuttgart include Daimler, BMW, Audi, Renault, and Toyota. This is the real power of the innovation platform that we're trying to build at Plug and Play. When we are able to put around the table the best minds, then we can truly accelerate innovation and technology. Plug and Play is the largest global innovation platform. We touch a wide range of 18 industries that often cross pollinate each other because of numerous technology applications. Our newest verticals are in the areas of animal health, ag tech and sustainability, which is the one closest to my heart. Focusing on our corporate innovation platform, you'll see in this slide the five most prominent reasons why conglomerates currently work with plug and play. First is to grow the organic businesses of our partners. <clears throat> for CP Group, we are working with the R&D team, which is responsible for driving the innovation initiatives 
of all the business units of the conglomerate. Together with our key champions, we are helping them transform their agro industry arm, media and telecommunications, property development, retail, and their digital businesses. Second is to give our partners a front row seat and line of sight into what technological advancements are happening worldwide. Later, I will talk more about our activities with ADB Ventures. Third is to augment our partners' digital transformation initiatives. An example of this is with Astra, when we hosted several of their C-suites immersion tours in Silicon Valley and China to look at cutting edge technologies for licensing and investment opportunities. To date, we've introduced to Astra International over 500 startups during our four year relationship. Fourth is access to global technology markets. For Facebook, we run their accelerator program, which started in Singapore in November of 2019 to support startup scouting, program planning, and execution of the overall six month accelerator program. The program seeks high impact startups that are looking to integrate Facebook tools and products and have since expanded to Shanghai, Brazil, Italy, and Silicon Valley. Fifth and last is to help our partners develop their next generation leadership. For Daimler, we provided special events like innovation days. We provided design thinking workshops for their teams, as well assisted their 14 business unit heads in doing proof of concept and pilot projects with startups. We've expanded our footprint globally in over 35 cities and 20 countries so far. The worldwide presence gives us a commanding ability to meet the best startups as well engage with various ecosystems. Thus enabling us to appreciate diverse problems as well as technology solutions. We currently have over 650 people working at Plug and Play and it would be important for me to note that over 200 of our team members are in the venture side of our business. What does this mean for our partners? Well, it shows our strength to source the, to source the best startups in all corners of the world. This is the core competence of plug and play. Further, and over the last 10 years, we have been able to build a strong and trusted brand within the global startup community. As such, we've been able to attract the hottest startups to showcase our investor and corporate network worldwide. In October 2019, Plug and Play officially launched its sustainability platform with its partnership with the Alliance to End Plastic Waste. For those of you who have not heard of the Alliance, it is a nonprofit consortium of 60 plus corporations from around the world and from different parts of the value chain. They have all contributed 10 to $50 million into a co collection fund over the next five years with the goal of deploying capital into projects and startups with a mission of ending plastic waste around the world. Plug and Play's role with the Alliance is run its global accelerator program. We actively source and vet new and innovative startups around the world that are focusing on tackling plastic waste with their solutions in waste collection, sorting, processing, market exchange, and end use markets. In addition to Silicon Valley, we also run programs in Paris, Shanghai, Singapore, Sao Paulo, and Johannesburg. Since the launch of our program, we have accelerated 32 startups, which has led to 75 commercial pilots and POCs. We also helped our batch startups raise over $35 million in funding from the Alliance and its member companies, Plug and Play and the Plug and Play Network. In addition to our work in plastics, Plug and Play is also launching programs in sustainability in all of our regional hubs including our Asia locations in Shanghai and Singapore. 
The purpose of these additional hubs is to tackle the difficult problems in becoming more sustainable. On the other hand, Asian Development Bank has recently formed an early stage social impact fund called ADB Ventures to invest in startups in the APAC region addressing sustainability and climate change. We're partnered together to help them out in terms of technology trends, sourcing of startups, as well co-invest with them. <clears throat> this is a new partnership which we started this year, and we're excited to grow this relationship to address other investment opportunities such as water resilience and carbon neutrality. Not only are we running accelerator programs, but we are putting our money where our mouth is. We are aggressively investing in startups that align with the focus areas of our programs and with innovative trends we are seeing in plastics, carbon, and water. We have invested in 17 startups in the last year and a half, and we are only just getting started. As we grow our sustainability presence in Asia with Alliance and ADB, we look forward to investing in the new and exciting startups that are helping the helping them to make the world more sustainable. <clears throat> As mentioned earlier, I moved back to Manila in 2013 to plan and execute on our expansion here in Asia. Singapore was our first office in Asia, which we opened 11 years ago to explore investments outside of the US. Since then, we've grown our presence here in the region to 14 offices. Asia composes of 60% of the world's population, over 50% of the top 10 economies globally, 50% of the largest tech companies in the world, and 25% of the largest companies in the planet. Opportunities are huge, and so I personally believe that the future of plug and play significant growth will come from this region of the world. And of course, I have to be doing something here in the Philippines. About five years ago, I co-founded Launch Garage. Patterned after plug and play, it also gives our portfolio local startups heightened access to our network of investors and corporate partners. We also, provided acceleration, we also provide acceleration programs for the Department of Science and Technology and Department of Trade and Industry. Our goal here is to identify potential startups that we can both invest in as well expose to our regional network here in Asia and globally. Thank you again for having me this morning. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me for further details on how Plug and Play may be able to help you in your innovation journeys, whether you're a startup or a conglomerate. Looking forward to the discussions in the panel following this. Meantime, I wish you all continued safety. May God bless you all. Thank you. Thanks uh, very much, Jojo, for that uh, introductory presentation. We uh, certainly appreciate those insights. I'd like to uh, steer the first question to you and, and follow up to your presentation. When, when we're talking about the, uh, the, the last mile of, of digitization, uh, with reference to the economic transformation in, in East Asia with uh, technology, where would the economic uh, motivation and incentives be for tech companies to consider the underserved as a potential market uh, from your perspective? That's for me, Matthew? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that question. Well, uh, long... Uh, Short question, a short answer to that. Well, in the Philippine context, 30% of uh, the underserved or unserved uh, market represents 30 million people in the Philippines or about 6 million households. Uh, my numbers may be off, but this may still represent a $50 billion spending per year. Uh, that's a huge, huge motivation, at least in my book, an incentive for startups to tap. Well, we just need to get them online and be part of uh, the, digi the digital economy. 
Okay, great. Thanks, thanks for that. Let's let's follow that thread a bit further. I'd, I'd like to turn now to uh, Dr. Nadeed with with AIT. Uh, from uh, from your perspective, uh, Dr. Nadeed, uh, what capacity and, and skill building uh, activities are necessary to to overcome the obstacles facing uh, last mile digitization and, and provide that market access? Yeah, we have, uh, thank you so much, uh, Matthew. And before I begin, let me just congratulate uh, Jojo for a wonderful you know, presentation and a very broad sort of view of how uh, one company can bring together large organizations and startups together and have such a big impact. And then especially starting the, the next phase in Philippines, which I'm really very interested to see how this, this carriage initiative is going on, because I think that's, that's replicable in many other countries. So maybe we come back to that later. So, so coming back to your question, uh, Matthew, yeah, I think uh, uh, what we, uh, um, you know, we see and for the last mile thing, uh, uh, especially related to the people who do not have access, uh, and uh, the, the difficulties in my view are, are related to, uh, first of all, partly the, answer, the, the question is I already answered that uh, the companies maybe do not yet realize the financial potential of, of, of reaching out to, to, to the under, underprivileged or, or unserviced un, uh, uh, communities at this point. So I think that may itself be one of the reason that the, the large corporations or the commercial organizations are not addressing some of the things because they probably don't see the size of that uh, market for them to invest or to, to develop products for that. So that could be one, one, one aspect. The other one is the physical limitations that are present uh, on, on site from the infrastructure point of view, from the lack of uh, maybe the capability to access some of the technology, uh, uh, maybe a general in, in innovation uh, from their, their perspective and lack of exposure. So, so they could, there are several uh, you know, uh, reasons that the, uh, the benefits of the this digitalization, digitalization does may not reach all the people, especially at the downstream. And, and there are many good initiatives around the world which are trying to capitalize or solve that problem locally. But once again, their reach is maybe limited and it's not scaled enough to be impactful. So, so I think the, a lot of people in my view understand the issues, but still the, their, for them to be supported, uh, the mechanism, uh, mechanisms you know, such, such as um, uh, we are seeing now, plug and play on a smaller scale may not exist. So I, I still feel that there's a, a three key, key issues. First of all is of course, providing the infrastructure and the training and the, the exposure uh, to the people. Second one is some, someone to, to highlight that there is a you know, few billion dollar to be uh, sort of uh, uh, the sizes is that. And the third one is uh, enabler who can connect those things together and actually be on site and, and deliver those services to them. So I think those are the few things that, that come to my mind. Uh, thanks very much for that. I think there, there's a, a very fruitful thread there that I look forward to, to further exploring with you, particularly around the, the connectivity aspects. Uh, but uh, with the, the view at present on the, the human capacity and the, the skills, I'd like to uh, turn briefly now to, to Ms. Thu from uh, CC Educare. Uh, and, and from your perspective, uh, what are the biggest challenges to digital literacy, particularly considering gender aspects of, of the digital divide from a, from a skills perspective? Yeah, thanks, not sure for the question and um, I I think some aspects like I think we're the one of the first company that would just tackle digital literacy issue in Myanmar. I think um, some of you may know that Myanmar has like a huge history uh, closed off and then suddenly um, we're open up starting from like 2014, 15, but then um, the challenges also become like um, hate speech and not really using internet for um, business opportunity rather than like kind of um, using for, uh, you know, like community. We, we use a lot of like communities, services and community, um, like communication, 
But what happened was that, um, and then a lot of hate speech and not using enough for their uh, business growth. So we're the one of the fast company and one of the fast social enterprise tackle this digital literacy project. We got fully support from US Department of State and we went through across Myanmar and start to offer this digital literacy program. And I think we see so much improvement in 2018 and 19, but now we don't really have that issue anymore. And another issue is financial literacy, financial digital literacy. So we, and, and then we, we foresee now is that, okay, like uh, what are the, another opportunity we could use as a digital um, resource to grow, right? So um, recently, last year, um, we started this program, which is helping women across Myanmar, like small and medium businesses, uh, women, then we were trying to like um, assess them, what is their need and what's their, um, you know, like challenges. So we offer this digital financial literacy program to them. And I think it's doing really well during the COVID as well. So um, I think country like us in Myanmar, which is like um, developing country really like value the, the value of digital literacy. And what, what also happened is that recently we find out that education program is also helping the country grow. And we also work with vocational uh, department of education to deliver the program that we run. That's how we're kindly tackling and we already make impact across like 20,000 people across Myanmar. So I think we could see it's a huge impact and we are currently like uh, following up with like, how is this program that we offer in Pet app? I mean, I could say for the entrepreneurial point of view, of course, if it's a government and regulator level, they can do a lot more with this improvement. Hey, great, thanks Thanks very much for that. I, I think there's a, a couple of vantage points here to consider. We've, we've started talking about the market opportunities of the people in that last mile of connectivity as consumers. But of course, we also have a, a great economic force here to uh, harness and develop in terms of these people being uh, producers and being able to access global markets and sell their goods and services on, on the global stage. Uh, so from that sort of perspective, uh, Mr. I'd, I'd like to, to stay with you on the capacity building question a, a bit to focus specifically on, in, in your view, what kind of support would these uh, entrepreneurs and, and people behind that last mile of uh, digitization need in order to be able to sell as producers on the, the global economy? Uh, Ms. Thu, you're muted. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. So, so to answer this, like um, when we started doing this, also like the digital. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, the internet is breaking up. If you know our country have a little challenging situation, the internet has been like a lot of breaking. So if, um, I mean, I could repeat your question, is it more about higher level view of this change that is impacting to the business? Am I correct? What's about how, what kind of su support do the, 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 the sellers need in order to be able to function effectively in the global economy? Okay, so, um, so when we run this program, we do this at first like um, SME, right? We target the SME and then we're assessing that what are the challenges to um, assess to, I mean, I mean, we, we don't just talk about global market. We really want like local market, local product to be seen across Myanmar, like seen across the country. So at first we assess the um, assess their product. Like we have a lot of like local make, um, handmade product and local product like fruit, vegetable. There are a lot of different type of entrepreneur. We really need the help of digital. So in Myanmar, we, we use Facebook as a business main tool. I think it would be funny to talk about like in a global market, but then we really use uh, Facebook too as a marketing and we use like, um, uh, how to say like, um, just like payment, also payment wallet. We, we started to use widely on this 
social media platform to promote the businesses. And then um, how as a city educator, as like an um, educator and also a connector, how we do is that we started to connect this business, um, uh, like how to say like the economy, um, economy like website, so we connect with them to this uh, website to sell and promote their product. We also individually help these small businesses to promote. Um, I am very inspired by how Plug and Play is also find the investor and connect it. I think it's, it's really helpful. We really hope for like bigger, you know, like bigger project, bigger connected, but then we have like um, very few investment here. I think we really hope for more investment to connect this small businesses to go into local market. And we also need a lot of um, like key player. Uh, we have like very, uh, we have strong, I think as SME community in Myanmar already, but we still need like this strong connector like plug and play to in, in the market to connect with globally to make it like presentable and you know, going out there and present their businesses. Thanks very much for that. Uh, Dr. Anwar, I think this is a, a realm that AIT has a, a few pieces of insight on. I'd, I'd like to turn to you for the, the next round. Yeah, actually, yeah, thank you so much. I was actually almost going to volunteer the discussion on this. Because <laughs> a few years ago, I just, uh, you know, uh, continuing from what Ms. Chetis said, because a few years ago, we had a very interesting project in Myanmar. We call it VOTF, Village of the Future. And that was actually funded by Unilever through a company, European consulting company called Zenot. And the idea was at that time that the problem of the last mile digitalization was really a major issue when there was no internet at all. So we thought, we, how can we bring the communities together? And what, what Ms. Sue is doing now was about four years ago without, the, without having all of the, uh, this, the infrastructure present. So we actually, uh, the AIT was part of that development of the tools uh, as well as the, the, the whole content to basically connect communities without the availability of fast internet. And so we developed special tablets which could run on very low bandwidth and they, had, they were especially designed to work in that environment. And they were limited only to do what we wanted to do. So people will not misuse them for you know, accessing Facebook at that time. So we actually preloaded those tablets with the, very, the tools that they needed to connect the communities with villages around that area so that they could do some commerce, they could do some, 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 some economic and social activities. So we tried that on a few villages and the idea was that we will scale it up uh, in, in, in future. So that's why it was called the Village of the Future Project uh, initially funded by uh, Unilever. But then you know, the things started to change and then the internet and other start, things start to come in. But that was quite a good experience for us to see how we could provide a low tech solution to a problem that doesn't have infrastructure as well as training. So our people went to the villages at that time from AIT. We have a lot of good students from Myanmar and that, that to us, it was a very successful uh, you know, initiative. And another one related to that is what we call a Dumbo project, which is again, a solution to the areas where internet is not readily available uh, or Im Im immediately after, after a disaster where you need to connect, quickly connect uh, people and qu quickly um, provide uh, infrastructure without the availability of the, the uh, you know, uh, internet bandwidth that you need. So again, it's a local network that is developed in that area quickly, which uses you know, uh, one uh, phone to another. And that, that, that project has been used extensively in, in, in Myanmar and, and also in Nepal, in Thailand, in villages. So that's a solution to provide the infrastructure. And the third one that I want to mention uh, is with that we recently uh, developed uh, uh, a data analytics, uh, data program uh, for, and data visualization program for people in Thailand together with the SCB, which is a major bank here. Uh, and that, in fact, that particular software program that we developed for, is about to increase their uh, uh, you know, understanding of data visualization and, and as well as, uh, uh, so that was addressing the capability aspect because infrastructure is already available. And that particular program became extremely popular. About 100,000 people actually applied to use that um, 
that program that we developed, we only had 5,000 uh, you know, entries because it was a, a kind of a mentored program. We couldn't do unlimited. And recently it actually got the uh, gold medal from the uh, HR Institute in Thailand because it was so useful for people who with, with uh, uh, you know, I, I would say uh, people who are not data scientists to get acquainted with data science in a way that they can use it for their job. So that program has really become our kind of a flagship uh, in Thailand. So these are the three examples that I can give from the AIT uh, kind, kind of things that we're doing on, on the infrastructure itself, providing uh, low tech solutions for the infrastructure, as well as providing programs that, that, that increase the capability of people um, and capacity of people to actually utilize the, the tools that they have. So that's, you know, few, I, we have a few other things that I can talk about, but I think that's probably enough for now. Well, we certainly look forward to getting to those uh, shortly, but uh, as you've uh, provided some, some very key tangible examples of uh, AIT's work and, and uh, uh, technology tools, I would like to also uh, take a moment to get some of your thoughts on what role uh, governments and regulators can play to accomplish the sustainable development agenda over uh, digitization with the market uh, in partnership. What would you like to see government do? Yes, I think uh, Thailand to me, I mean, I can only speak right now of what Thailand is doing. And I think Thailand has been quite uh, active in providing the, the, the public sector or the policy, um, uh, sec policy side or regulatory side uh, support for this one because the Thailand 4.0 is the buzzword underlying everything that the government is doing. So because of that, as you know very well also that there, because, you know, there, there is a lot of um, uh, government support under that umbrella. And there are a couple of very, very uh, enabling agencies who have done tremendous job in the last few years. Uh, one is called DEPA and the other one is called NIA, the National Innovation Agency. And the, the digital, you know, uh, I think the DEPA stands for, I don't want to get it wrong. So it, it is a digital, uh, no, I need to, to look up the full name. I will, I, will, I will get back to you with that. So digit, the, the DEPA is the, 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 the agency that government has set up to basically address the issue of this digital, uh, uh, providing digital uh, space for people to work. And it, it also addresses the policies. It also addresses the uh, training. It also provides uh, some funding. It enables startups to, to work in that, that area. So from Thailand point of view, I think the policy has and enablers have been, uh, have, have been developed as well as the government uh, agencies to, for people to take advantage of, uh, of that. And to me, uh, still that infrastructure and that has really not been as uh, effective as it, is, as it can be. And I think that has to do a, a little bit on the, the cultural aspects of you know being innovative and, and being uh, being uh, you know, starting your own businesses and taking the, those risks. That is, I think, another aspect. But from the government side, I think in Thailand, uh, the infrastructure and the policy support has been quite uh, uh, quite comprehensive. Okay, great. Thanks very much for that. I look forward to returning to some of these themes uh, later in our, our session today. Uh, having uh, focused a bit on uh, Myanmar and Thailand, I, I'd also like to uh, switch us briefly to focus uh, a bit on uh, Cambodia. See, uh, Mr. Rithi, you've uh, been able to join us. I, I hope the connectivity is, is holding out well. I, I'd like to hear from you on how uh, Small World Venture is addressing ecological and sustainable considerations in the uh, business practices for your efforts. Can you uh, speak to us about that, Mr. Rithi? Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep, you're good, please proceed. Thank you for having me. I was confused about the, the presence. Yesterday, my team has uh, presented and today there's a panel, so I didn't, I didn't know. Um, so to answer the questions, um, let me reframe the question again. Um, what what does small world uh, do to address the sustainable sustainability of the ecosystem development? Is that a question, right? Yes, that's right. In in small world's business practices. 
Okay. Um, so honestly speaking, we never really put uh, that into uh, uh, questions. Um, it has been living with us since the beginning of Small World. Um, when we started Small World, it was just a space where students can, um, student or young people can come and express themselves um, in a way that um, many conventional area do not allow to. And it ended up becoming a space where they then uh, starting a business. So um, we, we um, one thing we, we intentionally keep in mind and always practice is to open space, small world, open small world space or small world area or small world missions as a platform, as a docks where people can come, jump into the water and then uh, swim around, experiment, uh, learn how to swim. And then if they need some break, they can jump back to the docks. That's what we envision small world to do. And it, it has been uh, working this way ever since it started 10 years ago. We just celebrated 10 year anniversary last week, uh, last weekend. So um, yeah. <laughs> I don't have a I don't have a clear um, answer how this will, will play out of our sustainability or our practice that we do. But we just want um, what we what we want to do is to to uh, hopefully play a small part that a growing forest of uh, entrepreneur, uh, while at the same time growing real tree to make real forest. Um, so uh, with that, um, over the next 10 years, after the learning of the, the last 20, uh, 10 years, we, uh, we foresee that if we uh, continue to do uh, our focus only in economic development using technology to improve economic alone, then we will miss out a big part that make our life more meaningful to live uh, if we do not uh, think how that the uh, economic development should uh, develop alongside with nature. Um, most of the time, we sacrifice nature for economic development. Um, but what Small World is trying to do for the next 10 years is to um, do economic development with nature. So we uh, four years ago, we bought a piece of land, uh, about 110 hectare. Right now, where I am here, it's in the mountain area and see if we could uh, use the knowledge that Small World has and the, the resources and the people that Small World has uh, trained to um, encourage the next generation by providing a pilot where we, um, um, instead of cutting tree to make money, we will uh, grow more trees and hopefully uh, making a forest for the wildlife and also make money from the, let's say, carbon tradings or other ecotourism activity um, and uh, workspace in the jungle so that they, uh, people can uh, shift from uh, city to nature and then hopefully turn city more natural uh, friendly. Thanks very much for that. I uh, appreciate that insight. I'd like to uh, turn back to uh, Jojo. Uh, I think uh, you're in a, a unique position to be able to have a, an insight into the local economic development and uh, global scalability. So on, on this theme of, of helping uh, entrepreneurs and uh, citizens who are struggling with uh, last mile digitization challenges, uh, which of the key innovative strategies for uh, plug and play would you say would be the most scalable at the, at the international level? And how will this overcome those challenges of the last mile digitization and getting uh, local producers accessing the global economy? Thanks for that, Matthew. You know, I, uh, <clears throat> I didn't have it in my slides earlier, but uh, plug and play actually also runs an accelerator program in Bangkok under Smart Cities, which we launched uh, about three years ago. Uh, since inception, we've run about five batches, so far accelerating close to 60 startups. As mentioned, we provided them uh, heightened access 
to our network of corporate partners, uh, investors, mentors, and the like, no? During this, these uh, three month programs, which happens about twice a year. Uh, we current in, uh, in Thailand, we currently have about uh, eight corporate partners in our smart cities program, including uh, CP Group, BDMS, PTT, Thai Oil, KE Group, Bank Chak, as well as uh, two other conglomerates uh, from the Philippines, uh, Phil Invest Group and the Boyd is Power. So uh, these introductions between, uh, so these are uh, these corporate partners under our Smart Cities umbrella, they're, they're looking for innovations and new technologies in real estate and construction, mobility, IoT, energy, sustainability, and, and, uh, and health. Uh, so <clears throat> these are, uh, so uh, these uh, introductions between startups and, and uh, multinational companies have resulted to close to 30 POCs already in, in, in uh, Thailand or proof of concepts so far. No? Uh, I believe that, so I, I really believe that this is a real and working model for accelerating last mile digitalization for large corporates for large corporations going through their innovation journeys, as well as, as, well as for startups who's looking to uh, commercialize whatever services and products that they have. So I, I really encourage both, uh, both startups and companies in the audience today to come talk to us and explore how we can fulfill any of the gaps that you are experiencing right now or you, are, or you will be anticipating as you go through your uh, innovation strategies. But I, I really think that uh, this is, this is a, a scalable model already that, we're, that we are uh, executing right now. I mean, uh, uh, I, I don't know if you can consider it fast, but uh, we started with these corporate innovation programs less than 10 years ago. And right now, uh, as I said, we do have about uh, close to, if not over 550 of Fortune 500 companies uh, working with us. And uh, we facilitated thousands of uh, introductions. We facilitated thousands of uh, proof of concepts between, between these two parties. And uh, uh, whenever I get to speak with with startups and, and corporations, they both tell me that they're all very delighted with, with this platform uh, that, we have, uh, that we have created. So uh, I, I really think that this is, uh, of course, <clears throat> there are some things that are, that are uh, not under uh, our control or the control of startups as, as well as as well as uh, large corporations, you know, you know, we we were talking about infrastructure uh, a while ago, and uh, I don't think it's a secret that one of the primary reasons why this segment of the market, you know, we're talking about underserved or unserved uh, uh, markets, uh, is a challenge for private ISPs uh, to serve. You know, the demographics and purchasing power in these areas don't necessarily justify the CAPEX and ROI requirements for these private entities. So, you know, the responsibility, I believe, falls with the government to fulfill these gaps. You know, at the very least, I think that policies should uh, exist to provide bandwidth to public areas and schools, for example. Government should be able to provide affordable internet infrastructure for local private businesses to secure bandwidth from and be able to distribute that economically to the rest of the population. So you know, again, those are of course things that uh, still need to be addressed as well, but you know, at least on our side, you know, from, you know, if uh, I've had many in financial institutions, for example, uh, here in, in Asia, you know, looking for solutions on how they can tap the underserved and unserved, you know, for 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 uh, such products as microfinance or micro or micro insurance, 
uh, products. No? So, and uh, they have, uh, we've also had a lot of uh, uh, companies also reach out to us on, and on how to execute uh, uh, programs that tap sustainability affecting underserved and underserved. You know, like, for example, just, uh, just uh, uh, digital solutions for, for sorting plastic waste or collections of plastic waste. You know, so these things that really affect uh, uh, not just you know, the, the entire population, in, including uh, a lot of the uh, unserved and underserved. So uh, I, I hate to be just, you know, just continue on blabbing, Matthew. So uh, I'll just stop there. No, not at all. Thanks very much for emphasizing that, uh, that important point on the, that gap. Uh, before we return to discussing some of uh, AIT's uh, points, we have had a uh, question from the audience, which I'd like to make reference to. It's for uh, Ms. Thu. Uh, how are your SMEs uh, able to use digitization and education to move into uh, global e-commerce? How are you addressing that? Thanks for that question. So of course our enterprises uh, mainly target on education technology, but then we kind of like move a little bit into like plug and play now. I think I have a new inspired <laughs> company now. So um, what happened is that when we train, it's like, of course I, my background is IT and I'm very tech person. So I was just like giving a lot of uh, training and uh, showing them like, oh, this is how you can promote and this is how you can innovate. But then when you check, when you do a reality check, there's a lot of um, gap, like there's a huge gap that like, oh, they don't even know how to, take a proper picture to promote or they don't even have a capacity to um, use it online. So we, so that, that's when we find out that like, oh, like I can just, no matter how good the technology is, if they don't have capacity to do it and if they don't have the environment or, you know, infrastructure to do it, how do we even promote the product, right? How do we, how, how can they grow? That's why um, when, when we dive into this uh, education program, we don't just teach anymore. We really want to see the impact. So how we started to do this small SME, we, we mainly target, um, um, since I'm a woman, I'm more um, I, uh, kind of like encourage women entrepreneur because women entrepreneur in my country have lower advantage access to like not really have a lot of access to financial. So, so when we do this pilot project, we target 200 women across Myanmar and, and not just education training, we kind of like find mentor for them like and then every individual businesses we kind of like assess how they can go traditional to digital so that was really effective and we can see that um of course like going to global is the next level but then we really want want them to be make it more accessible not just to their like division of the country, but to like um, do it. But then there are challenges like logistic issue and sustainability. I really like how um, Mr. Jojo has been mentioned that um, how much we can do is very limited. Um, it's also have a lot of like government and regulator role play to support on making the internet, make it affordable. And also like uh, for a sustainability point of view, um, there are a lot of like, talent issue in the market. Um, let's say like we have the, this SME, very good um, coffee wine. I was, I really like the idea of like, oh, coffee and wine, you know, like people will love it. But then when we try to take this and then I was trying to, because I have a lot of um, uh, cross border project like Thailand and Singapore. So I was kind of like present their product to Thailand, but then um, I was sending sample, but what happened is that they didn't have like manufacturer issue. They didn't put a lot of ingredient on, you know, that was one of the example. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that there are a lot of improvement um, required to go to global market when I do the reality check. But of course, in digital point of view, I think in Myanmar, a lot of people are very eager and um, eager to learn uh, new things. And I think they're very okay with digital point of view. But I think we really need to tap on a lot of um, product improvement and also uh, logistic, you know, making it 
uh, because right now uh, shipping to Myanmar in and out very expensive. Like we really have to make those um, have to build ecosystem to make the whole economy to be like level up. So I mean, I mean, now of course that's an educator and social entrepreneurial point of view. Um, I'm more focusing on educating and providing support that they need. And so we already completed this support to 200 women and it was it was amazing. But then of course I they, they just got stopped there. Uh, we have a lot of uh, project that is, so we have a, um, one of the SME entrepreneur, we have, um, they produce coffee, uh, organic coffee. And of course, like we have to do a lot of quality check. And recently they export this to UK and I'm very proud of that. Of course, this is their project and they're successful, but then I, I'm very happy with like how I can kind of like tap them into using digital to make it more um, reach out to, you know, like networks, this global network. I think I have more plan to do it if I have chances to give in, and if I have more resources to give to help those entrepreneurs. Yeah, thank you. Great, thanks for that. I think that's, uh, that's very insightful. Uh, to return now to some of the themes we were exploring with, uh, with Dr. Anwar, I uh, appreciated the example of the, the use of, of low cost hardware and mesh uh, network architecture to address some of the physical uh, challenges in connecting uh, the last mile. But I, I'd like to ask you to, to come in more broadly on, on what approaches AIT is promoting to address uh, capacity building gaps, digital infrastructure gaps, to address some of the, the challenges and issues we've identified in the call today. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, Matthew. But, but before I, okay, let me answer this one. And I have like, actually a question both to Jojo and with Chu, but just to, because I'm, I'm worried about uh, some of the, the uh, maybe unexpected impacts of uh, scaling. And I think it, it moves the, the, the uh, original focus of maybe away from it because then it is driven by other factors. And uh, I, I think that's something that I would like to just ask and explore later after I, I answer your question. So for, for AIT being, a, because this is a postgraduate institute, so primarily we do postgraduate graduate education and we also do a lot of research. And with that, we have a, a outreach, strong outreach program. So we combine the, the education, research and outreach to create this, you know, the entire knowledge, uh, I would say, uh, loop in which we have students coming in to uh, get education. But at the same time, we spend a lot of time in, in doing some research. And they mostly come from the region. Uh, and, you know, uh, and then we always encourage them for the research to bring their local problems to, a, to, to, a, to, to, to their research projects. So in general, they are always, we, we find that they're always looking at the things that they have seen in their communities or in their countries or in their, in their profession back home, that problem that they want to solve. So we encourage them to use that as a research project or a thesis. And then they normally go back and then they collect the data or they, they get the information. So that to us is, and then when they graduate, the large majority return back to their homes. So this, this capacity building um, is, is, a, is a knowledge transfer is very effective because first of all, they bring their problems from back home, they find the solution, they get the education here, and then many of them go back and then start something, you know, impactful in their communities or the countries or they teach or so. So we have a large, you know, uh, uh, number of our graduates working on NGOs, working on their own companies uh, uh, and teaching. So I think that's a huge impact that AIT has in that way. Second one is that we, we do a, a applied research, a lot of it, which means it is all again connected to the problems that are in the industry or in the field. And we, we, we get that through our outreach centers. Like AIT has about 10 outreach centers, each specializing in one. For example, one is on AI, one is on geographic systems, one is on engineering, one is that. So they are very well connected to the, to the industry and they, they work with them and then they bring the, the challenges back and then research is done and the solution is brought back into the industry. So that's another knowledge, knowledge loop that we complete from industry back to academia and back to, from industry back to academia, back to industry. 
and, and that our centers uh, fulfill that part of transfer of knowledge and transfer. And one of our biggest center is called AIT Extension, which basically does, not, does nothing but capacity building. So they run all these training programs of the skill building. Uh, so actually AIT's regular graduates and alumni, we have about 25,000, but the people taking the AIT Extension pro pro programs is about 40,000. So there are 40,000 people in the region from primarily from government offices and from other you know areas uh, which that come to AIT for two week three week we program on building their capability go back and then practice it many of these are funded by ADB World Bank and other projects in fact we most of the, the development projects have the capacity building component and AIT gets involved in that and and does that so the project delivery is is improved so I would say. Uh, Education as a basic thing, uh, research, converting research, applied research, bringing it back, and then uh, capacity building, and also academia uh, and uh, uh, enterprise engagement, you know, partnership. In fact, AIT launched a new platform called AIT Enterprises Alliance, where we want to bring the industry and, and the universities together uh, to explore how they can work together. And I'd be very interested to discuss that further with uh, Mr. Jojo on how you know, that platform, which has, you know, is similar to what they're doing, but at a much larger scale, how that works. So I think that's what AIT is currently focusing. And the mission of AIT is it's a nonprofit organization. So the mission is to basically work on the sustainable development of the region. So that's, that's all what we do. So that's something that we, we think about and do on a daily basis. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So coming back to my question uh, before, before I forget, yeah, my concern was that many times I, I see myself also that I, when I started my first company 35, 30 years ago, I was at that time you know, serving a, you know, a certain group of engineers and, and, and the people at a certain skill level and a certain, but when I moved to you know, larger things, I almost forgot about that sector. And now I develop things and do things for corporations and bigger organization, because that's what drives the the interest and then drives what the capability of my software that we develop or things like that. So we kind of get got disconnected from the original target when I started the, the, the whole thing. And that's, I worry that when startups like uh, Ms. Chitan's startup, which becomes scalable, then whether they will still be doing what they're doing effectively right now, because they might be tempted to, dis to get disconnected from that and do bigger things and not do what they are really doing, and also Mr. Vithi, what they're really doing very, very effectively on the ground, at the ground level. So that's my concern. I don't know if that is well-founded or not. Thanks for the feedback. <laughs> Thank you, Sonia. Okay, uh, thanks very much for that. Uh, I, I'd like to uh, continue that theme a little bit with the, the next question uh, over to, to Jojo. Uh, I think we've had in this session a lot of uh, very good uh, success stories highlighted uh, for uh, scalability and, and lessons learned, which is great. Uh, in our uh, last moments of this session, I'd also like to deliberately make space to, to take a few minutes to learn from failure. Uh, I, I certainly am a, and I'm a big believer that we should carefully consider the, the cases that didn't work and see what we can learn to, to extract knowledge from, from cases of failure as well. And, and therefore, Jojo, I'd like to, uh, to put you on the spot a little bit. Your, your interventions thus far have been extremely positive. I'd like to ask you to be a little bit negative <laughs> and uh, see if you could uh, highlight for us what some of the persistent challenges you see. Uh, where have we tried but failed to overcome so far? What, what challenges should we be continuing to prioritize in order to uh, move forward the, the solving the last mile problem. Yeah. Well, I certainly have uh, a lot of stories, Matthew, on failure, you know? I, I remember meeting, I remember having a meeting with uh, Airbnb when they were still raising money. I, we didn't put in money. So that was a big fail. Uh, Facebook wanted to uh, buy one of our buildings uh, and uh, in exchange have a portion of the sale in exchange for equity instead. And we failed to do that. So you can just imagine uh, 
us scratching our heads uh, years after those uh, those failures. So, but anyway, I mean, uh, you know, uh, that's why I also don't believe that uh, VCs have uh, a crystal ball. You know, uh, I think it's still hit and miss. It's still, you know, we on the investment side, we always like to say we uh, spray and pray uh, uh, that uh, that uh, these these bets would come to uh, to be successful one of these days. Okay, but let's go. Let's let me uh, let me sh share with you at least at least my own personal. My or my own personal uh, experience in terms of failure in the area of in the subject matter of uh, of last mile digitalization. You know, <clears throat> uh, in the Philippines, you know, I, you know, I've been working with the government for more than ten years now. You know, trying to build the uh, their the startup. The startup ecosystem, you know. So, and I, because I think that the government really plays an important role in this, uh, uh, and and I think they do realize that it it is important to uh, to for job creation as well as uh, increasing GDP of of a country. I see that many programs are already in place and in play, but it's not to say that we're already doing our best, you know. For the last two years, the country passed. Uh, uh, two years ago, the country passed uh, the uh, here in the Philippines the Startup Innovation Startup Act, uh, which in principle supports various initiatives to build the Philippine startup ecosystem. Uh, an example of this is the creation of the Startup uh, Venture Fund that invests in early stage uh, uh, startups. There are three main agencies in the government which is involved in developing the startup ecosystem. Uh, first is the Department of Science and Technology. One of its programs that I helped start in the country was the Technology Business Incubators, which are university-based incubators now over about now about thirty or over thirty uh, in the entire country. Uh, these incubators are grant recipients for, for research studies. Second is the uh, Department of Trade and Industry and its main role is the commercialization of startups and globalization of scale-ups, okay? It also bridges startups with, with our 1 million micro and small medium enterprises in the country uh, to help these businesses go digital. And then the third agency is the Department of ICT, whose main goal is to build the internet infrastructure in the country, uh, as well uh, establish policies uh, in the ecosystem, also safeguarding uh, the public. So, so these, you know, so to add, you know, I wanted to tee that up before answering your question. Where I, where, where there is failure is because there is no continuity in my experience. You know, As I said, I've been working uh, on this in the government for, or with the government for, for the last 10 years, and now have gone, uh, gone through three presidents so far. Our two, presid two previous presidents get it. You know? So they put in place a lot of the things that I mentioned previously. Unfortunately, this present one that we have doesn't zero so i didn't meet him during his entire term in all the, i've met the presidents in and ministers in many countries in southeast asia but this one didn't call for me he doesn't get it okay so uh and the continuity continuity is 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 a problem and this is where i you know i i per, I, I think I think uh, the failure lies. So, so I I, uh, I hope we get to elect someone next year. Thank God, who will see the value of uh, innovation and technology for the country and its people. So, at least that's Matthew on on my side. I think that's uh, that's that's where I experience uh, you know because 
you know, it, it was two, three steps forward and, you know, one, two steps backward with, with what has happened to us uh, in the last uh, 15 years. Uh, thanks very much for those insights. It's uh, very helpful to take those lessons from history. Um, I'd like to thank all of the panelists who have uh, been with us today. I think we've had a very active uh, discussion with a, a lot of good points to take away. Hopefully we can uh, utilize these insights to help uh, the marginalized communities become more economically integrated both within their countries and uh, productively on, on the global stage as well. So uh, thanks again to all of you for sharing your, your insights and wisdom, and we'll now turn it back over to the organizers for the next announcements on the following session. Thank you.